Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who come out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to gather. Lord, open our hearts and minds to your word this morning. Speak to our hearts. Father, show us truth that will set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This may perhaps be your first time with us this morning. We are working our way through the book of Hebrews. Um, We last were in Hebrews on December the 10th, so we've had a month break. So we're coming back, and we're just picking right up where we started or where we left off. Now, let me remind you quickly as we jump into this. The book of Hebrews is a challenging book. It's challenging on at least Two levels practically. Level number one, it is a challenging book because it challenges you to be faithful. The book of Hebrews is a book that is written to professing believers who are struggling with their faith. They're struggling with life. And uh, so great is this struggle that they are questioning if Jesus is really worth it. So the way the writer writes, he writes as a challenge for those who would profess to be followers of Jesus to be faithful. Listen, is there a more needed emphasis in the church today than the need for those who claim the name of Jesus to actually be faithful to Jesus? We are so distracted and so discouraged on so many levels. We need to be encouraged. We need to be challenged to be faithful. One of the ways the book of Hebrews does that is by showing us that Jesus is better. Better than anything or anything and everything that you are tempted to substitute. And boy, are there a lot of temptations to substitution today. So it challenges you to be faithful. We need to hear this message in 2024. To be faithful to the one who is faithful to us. And the second way, practically speaking, that the book of Hebrews is a challenge, and I mean it is a big challenge, is it challenges us on our comfort level. Especially when you wrestle with one particular theme that is interwoven throughout the book of Hebrews. And that one theme is the theme or the issue of apostasy, of professing to believe, and yet falling away. I assure you, before we are through with this stroll through Hebrews, that just about everybody who hears this is going to feel some twinge of discomfort. And here's why. Because most of us at one time or another in our life, or perhaps many even now, are flirting with apostasy right now. Apostasy. Now, Isn't apostasy where you believed at one time, but now you don't believe, so you lose your salvation? How can that be? We're Baptists, you don't lose your salvation. So let me make you a little uncomfortable. Let me challenge some of your presumptions for a moment. As we prepare to jump back into this, because listen, I've entitled this message this morning, A Really Big If. A really big if. You you like the word if? If my first intimate acquaintance with the word if 
was in a Monday night tune sung by Dandy Don Meredith. Anybody in here know who Dandy Don Meredith is? If you don't, Google it. Don Meredith was a former professional football player with the Dallas Cowboys, became a broadcaster, was one of the original Monday night voices. Uh, and he had a lot of little ditties that he would do as the game was winding down and it was well in hand who was going to win. He would sing, turn out the lights, the party's over. But there's one thing he used to say that really got my attention, and I really, really didn't understand it that well until I got older in life. And it's a statement that has to do with the word if. He used to say, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? It's okay, you can laugh. Hey, it's okay to laugh in church. You won't go to hell if you laugh in church. Unless you laugh at Jesus, then you're in trouble. If. This is perhaps the biggest if. We have become partakers of Christ. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm to the end. That is a verse that is one of many that touches upon this issue of, of apostasy. What, what exactly is apostasy? Apostasy, according to I. Howard Marshall in the Encyclopedia of the Bible, says that apostasy is the abandonment of one's religion. Well, does that really help us? Listen, you can be an apostasy from Christianity. You can be an apostasy from Islam. You can be an apostasy from just about any religious belief. But apostasy biblically, although the word itself is rarely found in the English Bible, the concept is all over the place and it saturates the book of Hebrews. And here in this passage this morning, we are touching upon this whole issue once again. We're touching upon it with reference to the history of Israel herself. Israel's history was one of continual apostasy as they multiple times deliberately turned away from the God who had redeemed them. From the God who had brought them out of Egypt, they walked away from God and turned to other idols and turned to very sinful ways. If you've been with us on Wednesday nights in our study in Exodus and the life of Moses, you have seen that. Consequently, God judged them and sent them into exile. I want you to make the timeline connection. The Egyptian exodus and the Babylonian exile are separated by some six centuries. The wheels of God's judgment turn. Sometimes they turn very slowly. And part of that is because God is a God of grace and mercy, giving us every opportunity in the world to repent and come back to Him. But their history is just filled with the concept of apostasy. In the New Testament, we see apostasy occurring when men say they believe Jesus, say they are going to follow Jesus, but then they deny Him and they walk away from Him. It manifests itself in one of two ways generally. Number one, in falling away from faith when you're under duress, distress, or persecution, causing you to deny who Jesus is. Or it manifests in a lifestyle choice of living in open sin and thus denying the faith you profess. If you don't quite make that connection, apostasy more times than not, it's not an intellectual issue, it's not a philosophical issue, it's a moral issue. We stop following Jesus because something else is more important to us, and it's usually driven by the sin of unbelief. Yes, you can profess to believe and follow Jesus. You can profess it and fall away. Pastor, are you saying we can lose our salvation? That's not what I said. What I said is you can profess to believe and fall away. Thus, ultimately, you will prove you were not following to begin with. You really were in unbelief. Now, that's disturbing, isn't it? That challenges your comfort a little bit, doesn't it? It should. Let's get busy here. All right. We have begun this first foray into apostasy the last time we were together. In the words of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Look at that verse, because this is where we're picking up. Take care, brothers, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. 
Did you notice he's addressing Christians? Take care, brethren. Or at least he's addressing professing Christians. Take care, brothers, lest you find within you the reality of an unbelieving heart that pulls you away or that causes you to fall away from the living God. This verse is an exhortation to a group of professing Christians. The writer is writing to a a church. We presume he's writing to a church or perhaps a group within the church. Maybe it's the entire congregation. The application certainly is for every church. It's a group of people who have professed to believe in Jesus, who have professed to follow, follow Jesus, and yet they're on the verge of walking away. They're on the verge of turning away and returning to what they were before, what these particular people were before, practicing Jews. And they were looking at going back to Judaism, which tells me that these are people who at the very least are religious, but they're about to prove they're religious, but actually lost, that they've never truly come to be changed by Jesus. They were on the, in, the, in process or in the danger of actually walking away from Jesus. Now, listen very carefully. What they are actually doing is rationalizing unbelief as belief. They are professing to believe, but they are walking away from the only legitimate way to God, which is following the risen Lord Jesus. The cost for doing so had proven to be too demanding for them, so they are looking for a more acceptable substitute, something that works better for them. To use it in 21st century American secular language, they are looking for their truth, all the while walking away from the truth. My friends, that is not a good thing. By the way, there is no such thing as your truth and my truth. There is just the truth. You either embrace the truth that sets you free or you embrace a lie that will condemn you for eternity. That's the truth. So in this particular case, they're going back or they're wanting to return to their Jewish roots. They're they're failing to be faithful to what they profess to believe. And in doing so, the writer is warning them they are on the verge of proving themselves to be unbelievers. They are on the verge of demonstrating the great sin of unbelief. It's not that they're in danger of losing their salvation. Do not hear that. They're in danger of proving that they don't really have salvation. Why in the world would you abandon the better for the lesser? Why would you abandon the truth that Jesus himself says sets you free. Look at these two verses, verses 12 and 13. In these two verses, there are two exhortations, two imperatives, if you would, two commands. I'm calling them two challenges that are being thrown at these, and I'm going to call them drifting church members. Two challenges toward these drifting church members, and they're challenges that every church member Everyone who professes the name of Christ needs to hear and needs to heed. Challenge number one is found in verse 12. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. The challenge, the command, the imperative is the opening word. Take care. That's the way the New American Standard, the ESV, rendered this phrase. Take care. King James renders it take heed. NIV See to it. The better one, I believe, is the Christian Standard Version, the CSV, which renders this as watch out. Challenge number one, then, is wake up, watch out, be alert. A challenge to everyone who names the name of Christ to be on the lookout for an unbelieving heart, to be on the lookout for what the writer calls an evil unbelieving heart, one that is destined to take you down, one that is destined to expose you, one that will lead you to fall away. Now, you may be thinking, come on, pastor, I made a profession of faith. I can't fall away. I'm saved. I'm okay. I can't lose my salvation. Don't you believe that? Don't you believe the Bible teaches security of the believer? Absolutely, I believe it. Don't you believe that a person who's genuinely saved cannot lose their salvation? Absolutely, I believe it. That's not the issue being addressed here. 
The issue being addressed here is living in such a way that you turn from truth, demonstrating you don't really know the truth. And the choices you make in life actually demonstrate that. They demonstrate unbelief. That you really don't believe what God's Word is telling you. Watch out. Be alert for an unbelieving heart in your own life. Don't be presumptuous. Be on guard. Examine yourself. By the way, Paul exhorted the Corinthian believers to daily examine themselves to confirm that indeed they're following Jesus. If you ever reach the point in your life where you don't believe you ever need to check yourself out, you're already in trouble. Examine yourself. Watch out. Wake up. Be alert. That's the first challenge. The second challenge, the first one is driven individually. The second challenge is driven corporately. Look at it in verse 13. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So challenge one is aimed at the believer or the professing believer, the drifting church member, if you would, and that is to watch out for yourself. The second challenge is for that believer then to have an impact, a voice, a word in the life of the body of Christ. Corporately, encourage one another. Listen, this one exhortation, this one challenge alone is enough to show me why faithful commitment to the body is an integral part of the Christian life. In other words, we need one another. We need to be engaged with one another. We have a relationship with one another. Lone Ranger Christianity is not really put forth in the New Testament. Don't ever think you can go it with Jesus alone. Well, pastor, isn't Jesus enough? He's more than enough. But you need help in walking with him. Encourage one another day after day, daily. Day by day, as long as it is today. Guess what? Today's not going to be here forever. In fact, tomorrow's going to be here faster than you realize. And by tomorrow, I do not mean another today. I mean the end of the todays. It's coming faster than it ever has before. You don't know when today is your last today. So while you have that opportunity... Be engaged with brothers and sisters so that none of us are deceived by the deceitfulness of sin. One of my favorite contemporary New Testament leaders, or church leaders and New Testament scholars is Michael Kruger. He's the president of Reformed Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. He made this statement, and I absolutely love this. He said, accountability is a great ally in the war against apostasy. Accountability. Involvement in the lives of brothers and sisters in Christ is a great ally in the war against apostasy. Make no mistake about it, we are engaged in a war against apostasy. There are many in the church who profess to be believers who, the truth be known, are not really believers. And in time, their apostasy will manifest. We need allies to fight that. Accountability is one of those allies. We need to meet regularly with brothers and sisters to worship, to pray, to study, to be challenged, to serve. That's the way we're made. The church was God's idea. And everywhere you read about the church in the New Testament, what you read is a body, a group. That's the context of salvation. I have said this my entire life as a believer, or at least as a pastor, that we were not saved in isolation. Salvation has a context, and the context is the body of Christ. You weren't saved to go it alone. You were saved to be knit to the body of Christ. 
And that's important because the body helps us to be faithful. It guards us against the deceitfulness of sin. And if you think sin's not deceitful, you don't know sin. Sin will fool you. Sin will have you believe that left is right and up is down. It will have you believe that good is bad and bad is good. It will have you changing your understanding of truth. Listen, that's what sin does. We're part of a culture today, and I I never thought I would see this in my lifetime. Forty years ago, boy, that's just depressing for me to say 40 years ago when I was young. I used to could say 40 years ago when I was five years old. Forty years ago, I was in my 20s, which makes me old. I'm not going to say what it makes some of you. She gets it. Forty years ago, we were part of a culture where the truth of Christianity is a given. In fact, most everybody in the country was affected by this undercurrent of what we can call Christendom, of a world that had been influenced, at least in the United States, had been influenced by biblical Christianity. We cannot see that now. In fact, we're we're raising up a generation and preparing a second generation where all of that is gone. And instead of seeing Christianity as something beneficial for society, we are now raising a culture that believes Christianity is not only not beneficial, it's actually harmful. It's dangerous. Therefore, we cannot have any kind of Christian voice in the culture as a whole. If you can't see that, you're not paying attention. It's there already, and it's only going to get worse. As the dynamics of the population of this country change. And there are more and more influences from outside sources than what we we tend to call a a traditional American mindset. We're going to see more and more of that. I don't think we always understand that, listen, not everybody is like us. Not everybody believes like we do. There are a lot of different worldviews making up this country now. And it's just a matter of time before a different worldview predominates. And when it does, you talk about being a minority, we're going to be a minority in worldview. And by the way, that's not a racial thing. That's a truth thing. Doesn't matter what color you are. Doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. You either embrace the truth that sets you free in Christ or you're seen as something else entirely. That's the world that we're a part of. So more than ever, the church must stand on truth. We must watch out for our own heart, but we also have got to encourage our brothers so that sin does not deceive them. By the way, we draw all this from historical precedent. That's what we actually see in the rest of this third chapter. Verses 16 through 19 are an illustration built off of Israel's past to illustrate verses 12 and 13. Because when we look at what's being presented for us here, what we we find out is, listen, we actually have this tendency to not learn from the past. We actually have this tendency to believe that we're beyond the mistakes of our ancestors or the the ones who came before us. So we don't bother to pay attention to history. And we've got somebody around here who's always harping about history. Y'all ever hear him harp about history, you know, just pay attention to what he's saying. Right? Just checking. Verses... 16 to 19 are an application of what was quoted in verses 7 through 11 and then amplified in verse 15. Verses 7 to 11 of Hebrews chapter 3 is a direct quote from Hebrew, uh, from Psalm 95. Psalm 95, 7 to 11, the writer pulls it straight into this letter 
and he puts this out as an example of apostasy and the fact that it happened to the generation that came out of Egypt. This is the Exodus generation. And he's going to ask some very disturbing questions in light of where these believers, these professing believers in his day, are compared to where Israel was in that particular generation. He looks at this particular example and he says, listen, we have a history of being prone to wonder. It is man's nature to wander wander away from uh, from truth. Israel did it, and now here you are doing it. So Hebrews uses history. It uses Old Testament history to warn them and to warn us against the presumptuous misunderstanding that you can claim to be the people of God and not follow God. Let me put it another way, that you can claim a presumptuous understanding that you can claim to be a saved follower of Jesus and not follow Jesus. That's what this is addressing. And he calls it living in unbelief. So picking up there, the writer doesn't end the argument in verse 12. He actually presses a little bit further and shows his application with the necessity of persevering in faith, continuing to follow Jesus. The reality that a genuine believer perseveres in the faith. That's what he's addressing. And that's what I want us to look at very quickly as we begin to look toward the end of this. The reality of a profession of faith. Listen, the reality of faith, the reality of genuine belief is not the decision you make. The reality of a profession of faith, the genuineness of a profession of faith is not the profession. It's the perseverance in truth. It's actually living in light of what you say. The reality is not the word. The reality is the truth lived. Do you show evidence that you've embraced the truth? It's not a question of how high you jump. The question is, do you walk straight when you hit the ground? That's the real issue here. And the writer is crystal clear about that. Look up in verse 6 before he starts this quotation from uh, Psalm 95. In in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. What's the next word? If. Whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence in the boast of our Hope firm until the end. If we persevere. Christ is faithful to his house. We are that house if we persevere. If we actually show that we have been changed by Christ. He repeats that in verse 14. He follows the wake up and encourage one another in verse 14 with basically a repeat of that very same if. Verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ. What's the word? If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Now, be careful here. He's not saying that by holding on, by persevering, that you're working to save yourself. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the perseverance proves that you have been saved. The perseverance proves that you have been changed. Perseverance, faithfulness to Christ, is not a work It's an evidence that a work has taken place in you. That's what perseverance is. I like John Piper's thoughts on this. In in a sermon preached on this passage, Piper said, If you are a child of God, you cannot cease to be a child of God. If we hold fast to our assurance, we have become a partaker of Christ. If we do not, then we have not become a partaker of Christ. In other words, persevering in faith and hope holding fast to our confidence in God, is not a way to keep from losing your standing in Christ. It's a way of showing that you have a standing in Christ. That standing can never be lost because you have it by the free grace of God and because Christ has promised with a covenant and an oath to keep those who are His. So the issue here is not losing anything. The issue here is demonstrating that you have something. 
And that's what the writer is exhorting these people to do. That's what he is exhorting us to do. Now, I have no doubt whatsoever that this for some is difficult to grab hold of. I have no doubt that for the original audience, in hearing his message, they saw what he was saying as a difficult pill to swallow. I mean, think about it. Here we have professing Christians thinking they can walk away from Christ, go back to Judaism, denying Jesus, and still be okay with God. It's kind of like people today who believe or have this mentality, it really doesn't matter what you believe as long as you sincerely believe what you believe. You can live any way you want as long as you give vocal credence to Christ and everything is okay. You can be right with God while turning away from Jesus. You can be right with God while living in contradiction to the Word of God and everything's okay. So this argument gets expanded a little bit. He elaborates on it a little bit. Using Israel as an object lesson. And what he shows us is indeed a challenge to our comfort. Three quick thoughts. Thought number one, exposing the misconception. What's the misconception? The misconception is this, that it doesn't matter how you finish as long as you start. You understand what, that, what I mean by that? As long as you get started, it doesn't matter if you finish or not. It doesn't matter how you run the race. It doesn't even matter if you don't finish the race. As long as you start. The finish is irrelevant. That's a misconception. How you finish does matter. Because how you finish demonstrates that you're actually running the race. Notice verses 16, 17, and 18. As he lays out this, this series of exhortations in verses 12, 13, and then he hits it with the big if in 14. Watch out, lest you actually become an apostate. Encourage one another, lest you be deceived by sin. While you have the opportunity, while today's the day to check it out. And then he gives us this sobering series of questions, very provocative. Verse 16, for who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? In that first question, he's saying, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Who is it that provoked God after they had heard the truth? What he's talking about is the Exodus coming to Sinai, God speaking the Ten Commandments, them entering into formal covenant with God, and then the very first opportunity they got when Moses left for a very brief period of time, what did they do? They completely apostatized and violated the covenant. The question is this, who provoked him after they had heard? The answer is, was it not all of those who came out of Egypt? Now think about who this is. Has there ever been a generation of people following after the God of Israel more blessed than that one? Think about it. They saw the hand of God do incredibly miraculous things in delivering them from an impossible 400 years of slavery. If you believe Scripture, if you believe the Bible and that God provoked Pharaoh through a series of ten plagues that, listen, there's no way to describe them. There's no way to chase the, trace the origins of them other to, uh, than to the hand of God working. They saw all of that. They saw the hand of God. They heard, listen, at Sinai, they heard the voice of God. God made sure they heard Him speak those ten words. They quite literally experienced God as personally as you can. They identified with the people of God. They identified as the people of God. If it could ever be said of a people, these are a saved, delivered, redeemed people. It was this generation. Talk about a glorious start. A wonderful beginning. But what happened? What happened to them? What happened to almost every one of them? They provoked God demonstrating their life had never truly been changed. 
And they fell in the wilderness. They died over a 40-year period. They sinned and they failed. What the writer says is to enter his rest. And it was all because of unbelief. Who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? With whom was he angry for 40 years? Has God been mad at you for 40 years? 40 days? 40 minutes? 40 seconds? That's too long, isn't it? That's what we're being told here. Angry with them, he actually drops them in the wilderness. And notice they fail to enter his rest. Fail to enter his rest is much more than a failure to enter Canaan. The Bible uses that as a theological picture of failure to enter his presence. Is this text saying that these people all actually died apart from a saving knowledge of God? It certainly seems to be that way. They're demonstrating they're not true believers. And yet, Look at how they started. They started so well, didn't they? They didn't finish too well, though, did they? In fact, they didn't finish at all. Friends, listen to me. The most impressive of beginnings does not ensure that you will finish the race. In fact, it doesn't actually prove that you're in the race. A fast start doesn't mean a faithful finish. By the way, Jesus illustrated that probably in no no clearer way than with the parable of the sower and the soils. Familiar with that one? The sower went out to sow, sowed. Some fell on the side of the road, immediately was taken by the birds. Jesus tells us that's a picture of Satan taking the seed before it ever even gets to you. But then some fell among the thorns. It began, but it got all choked out because of all uh, the things that it didn't produce anything. Some fell in shallow, rocky soil. It started, but it died when it got tough. And then some fell on good soil and it produced. But only one in four actually proved to be genuine. The others proved to be bogus. Some of them looked good starting, but they died and produced nothing. Philip Ryken likens it like this. He said, what we see here is how little we can rely upon emotional experiences that we had at the beginning of our Christian life. Many people rely on a particularly emotional event in the past, the time when they prayed a certain prayer or a revival when they walked down to the altar, but none of us will ever have an experience as vivid as that which this generation of Israel, Israel, Israelites had. Yet their good beginnings still could not take the place of daily trusting in the Lord in a long walk of faith. Again, it doesn't matter how good you start. The question is, are you going to finish? Are you finishing now? Are you persevering? If you really want assurance of your salvation, then your faith has got to persevere when it gets tough. Making your calling and election sure means that you bear the fruit that goes with salvation. Scripture actually demands that. So watch out for the misconception that the finish doesn't matter. It's just the question of the start. No, the finish matters. The finish matters. Secondly, the problem. Explaining the problem quickly. Verse 15. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as when they provoke me. The problem is a heart problem. It's a heart that is hardened. The heart of Israel had been made tender by God with the work of delivering them from Egypt and providing for them along the way, and yet, look at what happened to them. They witnessed, he prepared them to receive his word, and yet they willfully hardened their hearts when things didn't go to suit them. Moses delays, they demand a new God from Aaron. After all God has done, they complain with every difficulty they meet. No matter how God, good God has been to them, nothing is good enough. That's a hardened, deceitful heart. Sin is nothing less than disobedience to the Word of God. It's failure to hear and to heed, and at the heart of it all is unbelief. In fact, unbelief is the root of all of our sin. You specifically, simply do not believe what God is telling you. 
Believing in God, believing God are two different things. The devil believed in God. And he fears and trembles. But the devil does not believe God. That's why he continues to do the work of the devil. Everybody in here, I'd be willing to bet, believes in God. But I wouldn't bet everybody in here believes God. Do you believe him? Do you believe his truth when you see it? When he says, do this or get that. When he says, be this or here's what comes. Do you believe him? Or do you pull a devil and say, well, we'll see about that. I believe I can get by. That's unbelief. The issue of faith versus unbelief is at the core of every spiritual issue in your life. Do you really believe God? Exposing the misconception, explaining the problem, lastly, exploring the remedy, and I've already told you what the remedy is. It's what verses 12 and 13 point us to. And that is, number one, being vigilant and watchful over your own heart. I've encountered a number of people through the years. <clears throat> I probably shouldn't say this because it's going on YouTube, but I'm going to anyway. Somebody told me if you have the feeling you shouldn't say it, you probably shouldn't say it. And that's one of my problems. <laughs> my own brother-in-law. I had a conversation with him almost 30 years ago. He was raised in church and... Let's just say evidence was lacking in so many ways. We had a conversation. And he said, you're barking up the wrong tree. I, was, I made a profession of faith and was baptized. I'm good. That, that's his answer. Don't talk to me about it. I don't want to hear about it. Don't question. I made a decision. I'm good. You know how many times I've heard similar words from people? Now, there's no evidence in their life whatsoever that the gospel has changed them in any shape, form, or fashion. Their language is awful. Their moral decisions are questionable. They have no interest in the things of God. They haven't touched the Bible in years. But they've made a decision, so they're okay. That is the deceitfulness of sin and an unbelieving heart. You're not keeping watch and... You actually are a living apostate. The church is filled today with people just like that. C call it cavalier Christianity. That is a dangerous place to be. If anyone ever comes to you and engages you in a conversation about your spiritual health and about your salvation, if you find yourself with that kind of cavalier attitude... Bells and whistles should be going off. Well, pastor, what am I supposed to do? How about I actually humbly and graciously exploring how God has changed your life and how your life demonstrates a work of grace? If you can't do that, something's wrong. Be on guard. Watch out. And secondly... Encourage brothers and sisters. Listen, I'm standing here this morning to encourage you. To challenge you, yes. Did I say at the beginning some of this may make you uncomfortable? Let me, let me rephrase that. One or two of you may just absolutely get spitting mad at me before this is all over with. You're going you're to think, he just is beating that dead horse. Doesn't he know I'm fine? Well, if you think I'm beating a dead horse, you're not fine. Let me encourage and challenge you this morning. Because eternal security is actually a community project. It is. It's a community project. Again, we're saved in the context of the body of Christ. So we have an accountability to one another. Remember, accountability is a really good ally in the war against apostasy. If there's something wrong with me and somebody will confront me on that truth and it changes me, guess what? I've got every reason to be grateful that God loved me enough 
to awaken me from a hardness of heart, from the deceitfulness of sin, to bring me face to face with truth. Because that truth is what really sets you free. You and I are in a daily battle against unbelief. A daily battle. How you doing in the battle? You may tell you how to do better. Get a brother or two. Pray with them. Get more faithful with the people of God. Get in a group with people. I don't need anybody. I used to think that. I'm learning this year particularly. I need people more than I ever thought I did. And you know what God has done to me in the last year? He's brought a handful of people in this church, and they just will not leave me alone. They, they just they, they pester me to no end, wanting to know how, how I'm doing. And I am grateful for them. I love these people. God blesses us with help, even when we think we don't need it. That's part of that. Listen, this is a really big if. He is the one who has built the house, and we are his house if we persevere, if we give the evidence that he's changed us. How's your evidence today? Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity on a very cold day to hear a very hot truth. The hot truth that we need one another. That accountability is a wonderful thing in the life of a believer. Father, I pray that you would help us to hear the message to wake us up. That we would be on watch, on guard for where we are spiritually. And that, Father, we would carry that over to our brothers and our sisters. As a means of encouraging them. Of loving them of helping them. Indeed, we do need one another. It is troublesome to see and to hear of brothers and sisters walking away, saying they don't need one another, that they don't need church, that they don't need this. They don't. Father, we need you today more than ever. We need one another more than ever. Father, awaken us and help us to persevere, to be faithful to the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.